It's all connected. 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 Yeah, you're damn right it's all connected, and, uh, wow, I'm telling you, man, it's it's kind of amazing how well connected everything is, how intertwined uh, everything is. Anyway, hi, folks, I'm Grim there, this is It's All Connected, yeah, I come on every Monday at 7 p.m. Eastern, 5 p.m. my time here in Mountain Zone, uh, but, you know, wherever you are, you have to adjust for yourselves, those time zones, you know, they're all connected. <laughs> anyway, welcome to everybody out there that may be tuned in uh, tonight here on the show. Uh, we have a bunch of people here in the chat talking, but uh, if you don't know where the show's at, it's on reallibertymedia.com on the It's All Connected show page. It's also there live on rlmradio.xyz uh, and on tunein.com over there on realliberty.org. And various other places we could be. And later on, later on again, uh, it'll be on all the podcasts, which go everywhere, plus, everywhere plus. So uh, check out later on for the podcasts and whatever I put into the, the, the post-show blog. I never am sure with this show where it's going to go. Anyway, this is uh, episode four of the all it's all connected show uh and, and this episode will be called uh, the planned planned global financial collapse planned global financial collapse oh man let me tell you it's uh the plan has been in the works for a long time now so uh let's uh, let's say hi and howdy to the folks here in the chat we got a nice chat come on over if you if you're out there listening and you're not in the chat Jump on into the chat here on reallibertymedia.com or rlmradio.xyz, and you can talk to all the great folks that are here today, tonight, this evening, where depending what time you are, where you're at. But uh, I'll just say hi to the folks I see chatting it up here. We got the Vinny. We got Anti. We got SLC Mike. Nice bitch Zori. Miss Chloe is there with us. Meister, Meister Brow. Uh, Grammy, Grammy, Grammy. <laughs> I saw I saw Circulo here talking a little while ago. I see Beetle. Uh, uh, let's see Rob works. Yes, Rob works. Can't forget him. Uh, who else we got up here? Uff, uff, duh, uff, duh. Uh, I think uh, maybe Kate out there. Hey, Kate, Moose girl, and uh, yeah, the Mighty Moose. Mighty Moose, by the way, she's been doing some uh, broadcasts here on the on the RLM radio and, and also on our Vaughn channel. Uh, so, uh, yeah, yeah, you might check her out. She comes on at random times, too. She's one of them random folk. Comes on in the middle of the evenings, middle of the nights, uh, depending on where you live again. Uh, so, uh, yeah, just keep an eye out for her. You never know. You never know when, when she might pop on and share some really cool stuff with you. Uh, like, like Zippix does, like Zippix. Yeah, and, uh, who knows who else may do that. We have, we have a, we have a group of, uh, people that do broadcasts here. So uh, any one of them, it's, it's all, it's always good. It's always good to uh, get get them on there, where, you know, filling in uh, uh, instead of the auto DJ at certain times. But the auto DJ is interesting too. I, I, last week uh, I took it. I had like uh, from April, sometime in April, uh, was the, was the podcast going forward from there. But last week I went ahead and put in all the podcasts going back to the beginning of the year. So you could get some of the flavor of the stuff before the Corona Bologna came along. And uh, uh, it, it's interesting to hear some of them older ones, the, the, the pre-Corona, the before Corona BC, the new BC before Corona uh, stuff. <laughs> and, you know, I, well, I'm finding, I know this is not part of the show. This is not, oh, not part of the, the topic of the show, but... Uh, uh, I'm finding it so interesting that the uh, this uh, virus, and I, I put that in air quotes, a virus, uh, uh, but but that, that this virus is so political, uh, and and all the things surrounding the virus are so political. Uh, I, I, it, it's I've never seen anything like this. I doubt anybody has, but 
Uh, I mean, right now we've got this big distraction going on out there uh, over masks. Whether to wear masks or not wear masks seems to fall along political lines, which I don't really understand uh, how that came to be, how that's a thing. Um, is it that uh, uh, people that are uh, on the more left, li liberal, leading side uh, think that you have to follow government's every order? Or are they more afraid of, of this virus thing going on um, than, than those that are on the more, well, they call themselves conservative, but they're anything but, just as the liberals are not liberal either, but that's a whole different story. We don't need to get into the definitions of liberals and conservatives here. It's, it, that's the labels they apply to themselves mostly uh, going on. Uh, but uh, so the, the, the conservative people are, are, are saying, oh, we're not going to wear those masks. That's a, that's a freedom infraction there. So we're not going to wear them. But, but then it comes down to uh, it's the, the pro-Trump versus the anti-Trump somehow. So apparently if you don't wear a mask, you're, you're pro-Trump. <laughs> well, me, uh, me, I, I'm an anarcho-capitalist. I am uh, not pro any uh, politician or pro any form of government there. Uh, but I don't wear a mask, and it's uh, I'm not necessarily saying it. it's because of a restriction of my rights. It's just stupid to me uh, because they don't work. Uh, well, all of the studies, well, not all of the studies. I've, I've read the studies from the other from the group of people saying they do work, and they don't really have any data backing it up. Uh, and whereas the people saying they don't work have a lot of data to back it up. Uh, you know, and, and of course, the, the pro-mask people will tell you, oh, no, we got data, look over here. And you look, and their data is all manufactured. So, eh, you know, you know, uh, whatever. <laughs> I just find it very so interesting uh, of how this... Uh, uh, this whole virus situation, um, whatever you want to call it, you know, the the shutdown of the whole entire global economy uh, can see can be politically based and politically biased uh, because how is how is it how is a uh, a disease, if you will, uh, be uh, how can that be political? If it's real, it's not political. That, that's my kind of take on it. Is if it were real, if it were actually this big thing that they said that was going to kill hundreds of millions of people around the world, uh, you know, like the 1918 thing, uh, then, then there, there would be no politics behind it. I mean, if, if it was, if you, if you knew people out there just dropping dead in the streets, I, I, I think that would kind of pretty much eliminate any politics involved. But that's not happening. Uh, and, and the way it's being reported... You know, <laughs> so so the politics are involved, and it's being used as a as a huge divide and conquer situation uh, at this point in time. Uh, those that will follow every word of the experts, the authorities, the government, the media, whatever uh, group of people telling them this is what's going on, but you go and look at it, that's that's not what's going on. That's not the truth. So. Uh, yeah, take it for what it's worth. Yeah. All right. Anyway, um, <laughs> as I stated last week when I when I did the show on the uh, the Federal Reserve, that was my my uh, topic for for the last for from last week from episode three, the Federal Reserve, and, and I discussed kind of some of the connections, uh, the ins and outs of where that came from, who started it, how it got there. And that the next uh, thing would be the Great Depression, which is what I'm going to talk about today. Uh, but I have still going forward other uh, a list of other topics still to get to in the, in the coming weeks. JFK, the Gulf of Tonkin, the end of the gold standard, 9-11, Iraq WMDs, 2008 recession. And we'll, we'll finally get down on, here, on down here to the, the corona stuff that's going on today. Um, but let, let's let's uh, get on down to the Great Depression <laughs> because I, I I think it's important to know um, uh, a lot of things about the Great Depression and and over on this uh, one site I, I went to several sites and uh, investigated various information uh, about the Great Depression and, and actually 
found things out for myself. Yeah, my memory uh, uh, of is uh, not that great, <laughs> to say the least. <laughs> oh, good. All right. So uh, Zori says she refuses to vote for a master. I'm glad to hear that. that that's a good thing. Uh, thanks for that, Zori. Uh, and, uh, yeah, you know, um, whichever. All right, so anyway, I went to various sites looking for information on this Great Depression stuff uh, because, you know, everybody says, well, well, well how, how did the Great Depression come about? And everybody says, well, it, it was the Wall Street crash in uh, 1929. Great. Well, that's great. But how come Wall Street crashed in 1929? What caused that to happen? And as we draw those connections back to uh, last week's topic, last week's topic, which was uh, the Federal Reserve. <laughs> oh, we come upon, again, the Federal Reserve being the culprit. Uh, uh, the Federal Reserve and those that own them, I should say, being the culprit. Uh, and it appears to have been designed uh, they, they, you could say it was by um, faulty thinking, fault, faulty thinking w w within the Federal Reserve. Um, but was it faulty thinking? They didn't know what they were doing, maybe, uh, or was it the fact that that's how they wanted it? Was that that because of uh, they, 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 they had planned this all along? Now, some of you may not know. But there was a uh, economic disruption uh, back in 1907, which uh, wasn't wasn't up to you know uh, Great Depression standards, but but it was it was economic depression, and that is a big part of what they used as an excuse to bring in the Federal Reserve. The Federal Reserve was supposed to come in and smooth out all of the bumps and. Uh, dips w within within the U.S. economy of things that are going on. Uh, yeah. So anyway, shortly after the Federal Reserve came along in 1913, uh, a few years after 1921, 1922, there, w there was another uh, depression. It was a smaller, shorter term depression that didn't have as much intervention involved in it as, as the Great Depression of uh, 1929 through 1946. Yeah, that Great Depression lasted for 40, uh, I mean, uh, how long? Uh, 17 years. Uh, so somewhere in that, that range right there. Um, that that depression uh, was not a short-lived thing. Uh, but what happened? What happened to, to bring that all about was that the Federal Reserve, uh, after seeing... Uh, the Little Depression in 1920, 21, 22, um, they, they said, well, here's what we're going to do. We're going to make money very cheap and very easy to get. And we're going to lower all the lending standards so that anybody really that wants to go out and get a loan can get a loan. Now, you remember, may remember some of this uh, from, from the prior to the 2008 crash or the Great Recession as it's been called r r r regularly. So, uh, yeah, you may remember the housing bubble and what brought that about and all the creative financing and the loans, the subprime loans. So you may remember how that was brought about and done, uh, even under all the regulation that had been going on and pushed into place uh, or removed. Um, <laughs> up to and prior to uh, when the great housing bubble began. But this is what they did uh, across all asset classes uh, back in the 20s after, the, after that first depression. Um, that, I, I still don't want to call it the first depression, but uh, because that 1907 event was a pretty big event, and it hurt a lot of people, but, and that was pre-Fed. Uh, so... You can't necessarily blame that on the, in them directly, although I think they had a large hand in creating what happened back in 1907 because they needed that 
in order uh, in, in order to get the rest of the push for the Fed. The Fed didn't just happen on that one night in 1913. It didn't just happen December 23rd. They they <laughs> in 1913. No, they, they they had been discussing it for a long time for years uh, prior prior uh, to, to the Federal Reserve Act being put into place. And whether or not the Federal Reserve Act and uh, the subsequent uh, uh, income tax crap uh, was ever actually ratified uh, in the Constitution, which they've erased most of the data showing it wasn't ratified, but I think we pretty much know anybody that was paying attention or looks back, uh, of course, we weren't paying attention, we weren't even born yet, but that looked back through the history, realized that that, that amendment uh, for the Federal Reserve Act uh, was, was, never, was never officially ratified. Uh, so the Federal Reserve has been illegitimate since it began. Like I said, it's another, it's another, another chapter um, that covered a little bit last week. Um, anyway, so let me, let me just share with you some of the stuff I found. It's a pretty good site that I came across. It's called Investopedia. And they have tons of information uh, over there uh, on various, various aspects of economics in various ways. Uh, so I'm going to give you a little bit of it here, uh, a decent bit. So, so that uh, you can see, and I'm not starting at the top of their thing or ending at the bottom. It's somewhere else. Uh, well, <laughs> that's another topic there, Rob Works, but you're right. The 16th Amendment did not create the tax. The, uh, the income tax is basically uh, uh, the, the IRS, uh, if you will, is, are the, uh, the bill collectors for the Federal Reserve. Uh, you, you can look at it that way. Anyway, let me get to this here. <laughs> All right. Speculative frenzies affected both the real estate markets and the New York Stock Exchange. Loose money supply and loose money, very loose money supply and high levels of margin trading by investors helped fuel an unprecedented increase in asset prices. It was an increase in asset prices, not not in asset value. Don't sorry, that, that's fine. You say whatever you want. I, if I read it, I read it. If I don't, then okay. All right. So uh, there was a, this huge bubble on all these various. I don't know if I have the number here or not. If I, I'll tell you when I get to it. If I do, or you'll know when I get to it. If I do, uh, but uh, uh, <laughs> the asset bubble back then, uh, it, it was like six hundred percent. <laughs> of overvalue on on most of these stocks, you know, uh, that on on the stock exchange, uh, they they were just wildly inflated. Okay, so the lead up to the October twenty nine uh, saw equity prices uh, October nineteen twenty nine uh, saw equity prices rise to all time high numbers, high multiples of more than thirty times earnings, way more than thirty times earnings. The benchmark Dow Jones Industrial Average increased 500% in just five years. Now, pause right here and look at what's happened since 2008 to, to just before the corona nonsense rolled in uh, to, to, to the Dow Jones. It, it inflated, I, I don't know how many times, but it's, it's very, very reminiscent of what happened back there in 1929. So in just five years, the Dow Jones increased 500%. And what was the, what, what was the products, the underlying products, the, the companies that were selling their stock, were they worth 500 times more? Well, uh, according to their stock they were, but not according to the products they were selling and how much of them they were selling. Uh, it, it, was, it, was, it was insanity. But it all rolled in because... Uh, you know, you hear about the roaring 20s and how everybody was living high on the hog. And it wasn't everybody, but it was all the people that were investing in, the, in that crazy stock market uh, and getting these just, just uh, what they thought, what they thought was going to be an endless boom, endless boom. But it wasn't a boom. It was a bubble. The combination of these factors was ultimately caused the stock market crash. 
created in 1913, the Fed remained inactive through its first eight years of existence. Inactive from 1913 through 1920, 1921. Inactive. They, they really didn't do anything. After the economy recovered from the 1920-21 depression, the Fed allowed significant monetary expansion. What that means is they printed money like it was going out of style. <laughs> monetary expansion. Yeah. Oh, I have a dollar. Well, let's make ten more out of that. Okay. Wait a minute. How'd you do that? Well, I had this dollar, and now I got eleven of them. Yeah, but how did you do that? Well, I had this dollar, and now I got 11 of them. That, it's, it's a circular thing. There's no real logic involved in there other than, well, we had one. Now we can have 10 times more. <laughs> it's crazy. All right. The total money supply grew by $28 billion, a 61.8% increase between 1921 and 1928. Bank deposits increased 51.1%. Savings and loan shares rose by 224%. And the net life insurance policy reserves jumped 113, 114%. All of this occurred after the Federal Reserve cut required reserves to 3%. 3% from, from, the, from the 10% that they had uh, written down there. So they cut it down to 3%. So now you can have just, you know, oh, okay, there's just crazy amounts of money there, uh, which they did in 1917, uh, which, uh, anyway, gains in gold reserves via the Treasury and the Fed were only $1.16 billion. Money flowing out the ass. Gold yeah, not so much. By increasing the money supply and keeping the interest rates low, what's the interest rate today? Zilch. <laughs> During the decade, the Fed instigated a rapid expansion that preceded the collapse. They caused the collapse. Much of the surplus money supply growth inflated the stock market and real estate bubbles. Yes, they did. Yes, they did. And you see that today. It's, 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 it's a mirror image of what happened back then with a lot of other nasty stuff involved. After the bubbles burst and the market crashed, the Fed took the opposite course by cutting the money supply by nearly a third. This reduction caused severe liquidity problems for many small banks by design and choked off hopes for a quick recovery. Now, why would they want to chop off liquidity for small banks and not the big ones? Because they weren't in control of the big ones, and they wanted to be. <laughs> so, uh, and they, and they, so they wanted to eliminate the, 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 little, the little guys there, get rid of them, throw them out the window, and, and let them be soaked up by the bigger banks so that they would have an easier path, an uh, easier way to control pretty much everything at that point. So, uh, wow. Sorry, I need a drink of water there. Now, in the 1920s, the, with, with the stock market bubble and the Great Depression, uh, the, the 1920s began with that, that earlier mentioned recession, a short but deep recession, which gave long, uh, a way to a prolonged period of economic expansion uh, caused by all that easy money that the Fed created or allowed for, created, which, uh, however you want to put that. Lavish wealth, the kind depicted by F. Scott Fitzgerald and the Great Gatsby, became an American mainstay during the Roaring Twenties. Again, not for everybody, but for those with means, it, it, was, it was just high times, living fine. The bubble started when the Fed eased credit requirement and lowered interest rates in the second half of 1921 through 1922, hoping to spur borrowing, increase, uh, increase the money supply, and stimulate the economy. It worked, but too well. 
consumers and businesses began taking on more debt than ever. What, what do you think the current consumer debt is out there today? What do you think the levels of consumer debt are out there today as compared to, say, uh, 2005, 2008? They're, out the, they're, they're over the rainbow, I guess is the way to put it. Uh, so, so, so uh, yeah, that, so the consumers be, and businesses began taking on more debt than ever. By the middle of the decade, there was an additional $500 million, which not, not, that's not today's dollars, uh, $500 million in circulation compared to five years earlier. The Fed's easy money policies extended through most of the 1920s, and stock prices soared as a result of the new money flowing into the economy through the banking system. This was all by design. There, there was nothing done here that was not planned, that was not part of the greater plan uh, to, to, to drive things to where everybody was so comfortable, so happy, so uh, prosperous, if you will, even if the fact of that prosper, prosperity was based upon a lie, was based upon massive falsehood and and the debt didn't mean nothing because hey i may borrow uh, you know five times my annual income today but that's okay because look i'm getting more money every day i've invested in the stock market it just keeps on going up it's crazy it, it don't matter how much i borrow i'll always be able to pay it off with with this with, with uh, the increase in, in the level of the economy. And, and so I have nothing to worry about until you do. Until you do. <laughs> so, so um, uh, what, what happened uh, when the Fed... Uh, did not provide a cash injection between 1929 and 1932. Uh, it watched the money supply. It caused, it created a money supply collapse to, to choke off uh, all of those banks, all of those small, smaller banks to, to collapse and be soaked up by the bigger banks. Uh, back then, uh, banking laws made it very difficult for institutions to grow and diversify enough to survive a massive withdrawal in deposits or, 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 or to stop people from doing runs on the bank. Uh, so it's it just the way it worked. The Fed's harsh reaction, they call it a harsh reaction, but uh, the, 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 the designed reaction, uh, while difficult to understand, may have occurred because it feared, no, it wanted uh, the bailing out careless banks would only, in, it didn't want to bail out the careless banks, the ones that just over lended, over extended uh, to, to a crazy amount because uh, they were basing everything on 3%, 3% reserves. Should have never gone down for the 10%. 10% was not enough to begin with. I would say one to one, 100%, boom, boom, boom. But no, 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 no whatever. Uh, they've been using that 10% number for a couple centuries, few centuries. Five centuries, something like that, uh, and, and so and that's been working. That's been okay. But when they drop it down to three uh, percent, trouble was a coming. Trouble was a coming, and it did. So the, the Fed uh, decided all those those smaller banks, careless banks, if they gave them money, if they bailed them out, it would encourage fiscal irresponsibility in the future. So again, what happened in two thousand eight? If if they knew back then that bailing out, uh, providing liquidity to these smaller, uh, more careless banks that were only careless because of the, the things they implemented at that point in time, if they knew, and they, of course they knew that these banks would go just crazy lending out cash in order to make huge profits coming back. Because, uh, of course, everybody was going to pay all their loans back, right? I mean, at that point, because the economy was just booming, and that boom was never going to end. Although the boom was only there for a short time, uh, it, it didn't matter, because some people don't remember what happened beyond last week, no less last year or two years or five years ago. They, they don't remember that. So they were going crazy, just loan out as much as you can. But in 2008, 
all these big banks that members of the Federal Reserve, the Federal Reserve System, uh, they bailed all them out to the tune of trillions of dollars because they're members. <laughs> and and besides, with, with that bailout, they can also uh, grab a whole bunch of properties uh, from from the average folk, from you, from you folk. Uh, because when the housing bubble burst and all those people uh, wound up having to be foreclosed upon, <laughs> where, who, who do you think took control of all, all, all those properties? And not only that, but, but they, they could buy all those properties up if they didn't have the cash with all that free cash that was being injected, uh, <laughs> that liquidity. Uh, so, so it was super easy uh, to, to do. So anyway, um, historians, some historians, argue that the Fed created the conditions, which those historians are right, that caused the economy to overheat, uh, all planned out, all connected, uh, then exacerbated an already dire economic situation. Boom, boom, boom. Where's your pencil? You got dots on the paper? Draw a line. Draw another line. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> Then, then come along President Herbert Hoover. Herbert Hoover. <sighs> yeah, well, <laughs> he's, he's a, he's a post Wilsonite, but yes, pencils for the win. They're, they're uh, what's that, what's that name? Something about a pencil that she uses. Uh, I forget Chloe's pencil name. Anyway, <laughs> okay, it says here, although often characterized, push a pencil, push a pencil, that's it. All right, although often characterized as a do-nothing president, Herbert Hoover did take action after the crash occurred. Bad action. Between 1930 and 1932, he increased federal spending by engaging uh, by by federal spending by 42% engaging in what Trump's trying to do right now a massive public works program such as uh, the reconstruction finance corporation Trump is trying to follow this guy's practices what this guy did it's insanity okay everybody's broke the economy's crashed we got nothing left let the federal government spend a whole bunch of money. Wait, you don't have any money. That's okay. We'll print it up. <laughs> this this guy, this guy, Herbert Hoover, is is what Trump is trying to do right now. It is total insanity. Uh, I, I'm sure you've heard a word of, of Trump's uh, public works programs he's trying to do, rebuild the infrastructure of the country. Yeah, that's what he's thinking. Uh, he wants to, to create and spend all this money on such like this. And, although Trump hasn't gotten to this part yet, he's on the other side of this issue, raising taxes to pay for the programs. Uh, Hoover banned immigration. Sound familiar? Hoover banned immigration in the 1930s to keep low-skilled workers from flooding the labor market. Sound familiar? All right. <laughs> History repeats. Remember it or not. All right. <laughs> Unfortunately, many of his and Congress' other post-crash interventions, interventions, wages, uh, labor, trade, and price controls damage the economy's ability to adjust and reallocate re resources. One of Hoover's main concerns was that workers' wages would be cut following the economic downturn. To ensure high paychecks in all industries, he reasoned, prices needed to stay high. So he put in price controls. <laughs> To force the price of everything artificially up, so uh, consumers would need to pay more. Now he's worried about you out there making less money, so he wants to make sure to to do that. That raise the price of everything that will keep workers' wages up, huh? <laughs> 
I don't know what these guys, these guys must have had the best weed ever because, man, that is some stoned-ass thinking right there. Uh, the public had been burned badly in the crash, and most people did not have the resources to spend lavishly on goods and services. They are broke ass at that point. Most of them didn't even have jobs, and companies uh, they could not count on overseas trade as national as as foreign nations were not willing to buy overpriced American goods any more than Americans were. Again, sound familiar? <laughs> so, so what? what <laughs> so, so they, so Hoover said, "All right, we're going to protectionist protectionist policies here." We're gonna we're gonna make sure that we that we are imposing tariffs, large tariffs, on all foreign goods and all foreign countries. It's like this is it's like a replay. What we're seeing is a replay, but this is being done. Although post two thousand eight Great Recession, uh, pre twenty twenty throughout the twenty twenties. The, the biggest depression you've ever, you can't even imagine the depression that's coming. You, you, <laughs> it is, it is going to be so huge, so massive. There's going to be so many people that are just destitute. Uh, a lot of those already are now. I mean, a lot, a lot of that's already occurred. Um, I, you, you know, it, it's, 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 it's a wild thing to even consider. Um, uh, that's, that's why I called today's show the planned global financial collapse planned planned global financial collapse so uh but anyway back to the to the 30s <laughs> the bleak reality forced hoover to use legislation to prop up prices and hence wages by choking out cheaper foreign competition following the tradition of protectionists and against the protests of more than a thousand uh, of the nation's economists all the economists were saying, you can't do this. This is idiotic. And Hoover said, eh, I'll do what I want. And, and again, <laughs> Hoover signed into law the Smoot-Hawley Tariff Act of 1930. Now, I don't know what, what Trump's Tariff Act is called. It's not famous like the Smoot-Hawley Act. But that act was initially a way to protect agriculture, but swelled into multi-industry tariff imposing huge duties on more than 880 foreign products. Nearly three dozen countries said, hey, 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 wait a minute. This goes two ways. <laughs> so imports fell from $7 billion in 1929 to just $2.5 billion by 1932. Uh, and by 1934, international trade had declined overall the entire globe, international trade declined by two-thirds, 66%. Not surprisingly, economic conditions kept on getting worse. Hoover's desire to maintain jobs and individual and corporate income levels was understandable. Sure, he was just an idiot, like Trump. Uh, however, he encouraged businesses to raise wages, avoid layoffs, and keep high prices at a time when they naturally should have fallen. Just like today. Prices should be through the floor. The stock market should be 10% at the max of what it is today. All, all the exchanges. Uh, yeah. But but no, it's it's artificially pushed high, just as gold and silver are pushed artificially low. That's a whole other story. We're going to get to that later weeks. So with the previous cycles of the recession depression, the United States suffered one to three years of low wages and unemployment before dropping prices finally led to a recovery. So. It happened anyway. They didn't want it to happen. They tried to prevent it from happening, but it happened anyway. Uh, and and they just extended the pain for everybody by doing what they did, by the U.S. interventionism in itself. 
unable to sustain the artificial levels with global trade effectively cut off, the United States economy continued to deteriorate from the recession to a depression. Then we have 1933. And the next moron, I mean, a wonderful guy that everybody looks up to and thanks ever so much for what he did, voted into office in 1933. President Franklin D. Roosevelt promised massive change. The New Deal. The New Deal! <laughs> they say it was innovative, unprecedented, series of domestic programs and acts designed to bolster American business, reduce unemployment, and protect the public in 1933, mind you. Loosely based on Keynesian economics. Now, anybody out there that's familiar with Keynesian economics knows what a bad plan that was. If you're not familiar with Keynesian economics... <laughs> Uh, go out there and look. Look at Keynesian economics versus, versus Austrian economics, and you'll see the problem, the problem <laughs> with Keynesian economics. <laughs> oh, Anyway, with the concept that the government could and should stimulate the economy, the New Deal set lofty goals to create and maintain a national infra infrastructure, full employment, and healthy wages. The government set about achieving these goals through price, wage, and production controls. You can't do that. You can't. That's backwards. That's not how market economics work. <laughs> some, some economists claim that Roosevelt continued many of Hoover's interventions just on a larger scale. Those economists are right. Uh, he kept in place a rigid focus of price supports and minimum wages and removed the country from the gold standard. Now, this was the first episode of removing from the gold standard. We'll get more into the total re removal of the gold standard later on when, when, we, when we get to the 70s. It takes a while to get out there because I'm kind of going... Semi chronologically. <laughs> Forbidding individuals to hoard gold coins. Yeah, if you had gold coins back then, they they want them and, and they would steal. Or just bullion, which a lot of y'all may have some bullion. Uh, he banned a mono, monopolistic, some uh, <laughs> some consider them competitive business practices. So no more competitive business practices allowed and instituted dozens of new public works socialist socialist spell public works spell socialist programs and other job creation agencies the roosevelt administration paid farmers and ranchers to stop or cut back on production that's still going on today they pay corn farmers uh, chicken ranchers all kinds of different uh, industries out there to stop producing all right you know, you make this much money producing corn every year. Here's the money. Don't produce any corn. <laughs> I, I, yeah. <laughs> All right. So um, well, one of the most heartbreaking conundrums of the period was the destruction of excess crops. Despite the need for thousands of Americans access to affordable food. Sorry. We, we didn't want all that production. We paid them not to produce. Now you can't buy affordable food any longer. Federal taxes tripled, tripled between 1933 and 1940 to pay for these initiatives. So we're starving you out, and we're going to steal more money from you as well. Uh, <laughs> so also new programs such as Social Security, which is been on its last leg for 30, 40 years now, uh, which they, it should have never been on its last leg if it was working as designed as people pay in and they use that money. But, of course, that was not the case. That's not how it worked. Anyway, so 
So he rolled in the Social Security, the, which I am going to take advantage of when I get there, assuming it's still there in two years. <laughs> I paid in for a, a lot of years, and I'm going to get my money back, damn it, if I can. Uh, so these increases included hikes and in excise taxes, personal income taxes, inheritance taxes, corporate income taxes, and excess profits tax. What? The hell's excess profit? <laughs> <coughs> Apparently, the New Deal, at least according to this here, uh, reinstilled public confidence. I, I, which I, the, the public is morons. They were morons back then. They're morons today. As as there were measurable results, such as reform and stabilization of the financial system. No thanks to the Fed. Roosevelt declared a bank holiday for an entire week in 1933, so look forward to that coming along, a bank holiday. Which, it's not what you think. It's not, the bank's not going to send you to Hawaii. No, a bank holiday is when they shut down the banks overnight, so you can't get any cash out, or put any in, if that's what you need to do. <laughs> They, he did that. Uh, well, it's been broke for a long time. Like I said, I'll, I'll, I'll get to that another week. <laughs> that's, that, that's a whole other story. <laughs> anyway, um, so so in 1933, there was a bank holiday to prevent institutional collapse due to panicked withdrawals. <laughs> A program of construction of a network of dams, bridges, and tunnels, and roads still uh, still in use followed. So, yeah, we got the national highway system out of it, which, okay, that was a bonus, that was a plus, uh, but there was roads already existing. We didn't really need uh, the national highway system. We didn't need I-10 and I-40 and I-70 and whatever I's. Are, are looking upon it. Uh, we, we didn't need all those. There were already roads doing that job, and as roads were needed, people built them. Uh, this this was overkill for back then. And a lot of places, uh, you're driving along in, in the middle of nowhere, and you're thinking, why the hell do I have an eight-lane freeway here, and, and I'm the only car on it? <laughs> but that's all right. In some places, they're good. Of course, those places would have been taken care of Anyway, by the locality, localities uh, where, where they are required, uh, such as your cities, um, <laughs> and not out in the middle of nowhere uh, where, where they're not needed. You don't need eight lanes going through rural New Mexico, but there they are. All right. <laughs> anyway. Um, so anyway, so we, we got the, the national, uh, the, the dams and the bridges and the tunnels and the roads and all that. So that's all good and wonderful. You got your Social Security. That's all good and wonderful. The projects gave employment to thousands via the federal work program, which is what Trump is trying to do today. He wants to do, he wants to replicate the nonsense of the New Deal. The economy recovered to an extent, but the rebound was way, way too weak for the New Deal policies to be unequivocally deemed successful in pulling America out of the Great Depression. Historians and economists disagree on the reason. Keynesians, who always blame somebody for something, blame a lack of federal spending. They spent out the ass. What do you mean a lack of federal spending? Roosevelt didn't go far enough in his government-centric recovery plans. Conversely, wiser people claim that to, uh, by trying to spark immediate improvement instead of letting the economic business cycle follow the usual two-year course of hitting the bottom and then rebounding, Roosevelt, like Hoover, prolonged the Depression. Absolutely freaking right. Did I get to the part? <laughs> I don't know what time we got here. Uh, there's so much more. There's so much more to cover. Um, 
And, and a lot of people say that uh, World War II pulled us out of the Depression. It didn't. It didn't. But it came after the end of World War II uh, that, that things started finally uh, getting back to some amount of normalcy and some amount of prosperity and so, uh, some amount of logical thinking. So, um, uh, anyway, according to this here, the notion that the war ended the Great Depression is a broken window fallacy. The conflict did put the United States on the road to recovery. Uh, the, the war opened international trading channels, which were in, put in place by the people trying to take credit for that. I am not doing another hour. <laughs> <laughs> no. But thank you for the offer, uh, and thank you for the compliment. Uh, so, <laughs> I guess that's a compliment on a roll. Eh? Anyway, so so the war opened the international trading channels and reversed price and wage controls. Suddenly, there was government demand for inexpensive products. Government demand, regular demand, everybody demand, uh, which which created a massive fiscal stimulus, meaning the free market provided what was needed, as it would have done had you not pushed in all the socialistic stuff back in the early 30s. When the war ended, the trade routes remained open. They, they didn't reimpose all the tariffs and uh, do all that nasty stuff. In the first 12 months afterward, private investments rose from $10.6 billion to $30.6 billion, tripled. The stock market broke into a bull run in a few short years. The bottom line of all this, the bottom line, the Great Depression was the result of, well, it says unlucky, but I'm saying planned combination of factors, a flip-flopping Fed, a uh, devious, deceitful Fed, protectionist tariffs, and inconsistently applied government interventionist efforts. It could have been shortened or even ended or avoided altogether by changing any one of those factors. And not having the Fed would have been the first factor. They, they, they were the evil behind all of this. Uh, the tariffs, insanity, uh, the, the, the controls, the price controls, the production controls, absolute lunacy. So while the debate continues as to whether the interventions were appropriate, they weren't. Many of the reforms from the New Deal, such as Social Security, unemployment insurance, and our agricultural subsidies exist to this day. That they do. Although Social Security was supposed to be insurance, that's not how it works. Unemployment was supposed to be insurance, that's not how it works. And agricultural subsidies are just terrible. So all of those things that from the New Deal that still exist to this day, either not working as designed or promised or just terrible. <laughs> the assumption that the federal government should act in the times of national economic crisis is now strongly supported. No, it's not. No. <laughs> This legacy is one of the reasons the Great Depression is considered one of the seminal events in modern American history. So they said the assumption that the federal government should act in times of national economic crisis is now strongly supported. That is insanity. Every time the government puts its fingers into something, it breaks it. It messes it up. It, it, it causes far more problems than it ever should. Um, <laughs> all right, all right, all right, all right. <laughs> so basically what happened here, the Fed caused the early, the 1907 depression, short um, financial interruption, however you want to call it, in order so that uh, people would say, well, we need something better because our banking system ain't hang handling it. And the Federal Reserve said, hey, We'll come right along, and we'll smooth out all the bumps and the dips, and everything will be just fine. Of course, that's not what happened, of course. We've, we've all seen it in the 100-plus years since then. And so they came along, and they, they sat back, and they watched for a while. 
Uh, and, and, and then they said, okay, let's do something here in the, in the early 20s. Ba-boom, ba-boom, boom, boom. <laughs> oh, look at that. Okay, we can fix this. And they did. They did fix that. And they said, well, now what we want is we want to get rid of all these little banks and a bunch of people's personal property and steal all kinds of stuff. And so they, the, the Great Depression happened. All right. Let me see what Rob, Rob Works is asking me a question. What do I think about this story about the Fed being taken over by the Treasury? I think it's wishful thinking. That's what I think. I, I, I think it's, um, it's a good way to get people to quit looking. Did I have sound effects? <laughs> wait, wait, you had, I don't know. Anyway, it's a good way uh, because right now, uh, well, and, and for, for a while, uh, now there's there's been a push in the lower echelons, the ignored echelons of Congress to to go in and examine the Federal Reserve and its actions and what it's doing. Of course, it'll never happen because they're running the show. Well, the Federal Reserve and the global banking cartel altogether. So I I, I don't think uh, that 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 the uh, the Treasury can actually take over the Federal Reserve. It sounds nice. It sounds like a good idea until you realize who runs the treasury, <laughs> which which is your government, and and you look through the things, the programs and projects that the government puts into into place, uh, and and realize that every one of them it screws up, no matter how badly. Uh, so I I haven't read the article. I, I would have to read it later on. And uh, it, it, if I can even read it, it's on Wall Street Journal. They have a paywall. I'm not sure they'll let me in. Um, but but uh, I, I think maybe no. Uh, maybe no on that, uh, Rob. So, yeah, okay. Restricted article. All right, I, I, I'm sure I could find more on it from other places. And, and, I'll, and I'll look for that. Uh, more on the Treasury slowly taking over the Federal Reserve. So, uh, yeah, yeah. Other people write, and they put it out there free. Wall Street Journal, yeah, and whatever. <laughs> all right, all right. Uh, I'm gonna, and then there's plenty more to talk about on the Depression and the Fed and, and all that. But next week, I'm getting into something completely different. Although, not completely different. And that's John Fitzgerald Kennedy. Yeah, John Fitzgerald Kennedy. You want to tie him back to the Fed? Yeah, yeah, I think we can do that fairly easily. <laughs> what y'all think about that? I'm not an expert on JFK, by the way. So anybody that's got uh, little tidbits they want to feed me on JFK, um, <laughs> feel free to uh, email me, liberty at reallibertymedia.com, and uh, you e email me your tidbits about JFK, because that will be the, the topic, the main topic next week. And uh, various aspects leading on up to that. So, uh, yeah, uh, look forward to that one. Um, tomorrow, 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 tomorrow. Yes, fairly easily. Yes, easily is very fair. All right. Um, t tomorrow is in a perfect world with Flash somebody and hopefully with Grams as well uh, 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 at uh, 3 p.m., 3 p.m. Eastern on RLM Radio. Um, no live shows on Wednesday, so if anybody wants to do it, let me know. Uh, of course, I do kind of like having a full day off, which you may not understand. If I'm not doing the show, why don't I have a day off? But I don't. Anyway, <laughs> check the schedule on reallibertymedia.com for all the shows coming up throughout the rest of the week. And what else? That's all, I guess. Have a great uh, Monday evening, wherever you're from, Monday night. Talk to you later. Peace. It's all, it's all, it's all connected. 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 It's all connected.